Wellbeing Board. I'm Chancellor Simon Jones, Chair of the Board, and I'm obliged to inform you that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded. Members of the public will be able to see this meeting and hear the audio. Um, so in attendance of uh, the meeting, if we can do a creeping death around the room, um, everybody can introduce themselves and their role. Okay, so Penny. Morning. Hi, I'm Penny Basin, Head of Joint Partnerships, a joint role between Shropshire and Top and Week and CCG and Shropshire Council. Councillor Kirsty has my portfolio holder for children and education. Uh, Mark Brandreth, Interim Council Officer out for CCG. Uh, Jackie Jeffrey, Chief Officer of Sins of Ice Shropshire, but um, representing the Voluntary Sector Assembly. Lynn Corley, Chief Officer, Health Work Shropshire. Good morning, Tanya Mars, Exec Director of People for Shropshire Council. Good morning, Chief Hill, uh, Superintendent from West Mercy, please. Good morning, Rachel Robinson, Director of Public Health for Shropshire. Good morning, uh, Barb Cross, I'm a Health and Wellbeing Officer for Shropshire Council. Right, thank you. For, um, OK, apologies so far. We've had uh, apologies from Claire Parker uh, and she's asked Julie Garside to substitute. I don't know if Julie is. I think she's here. She's all right. No. No, sorry, Julie's not available, so I'm here representing the CCG today. Ah, oh, right. Sorry. <coughs> um, John Pepper. Uh, Look, John's joining us virtually. John's joining us virtually. Yeah, yeah. hello, John. <laughs> Um, Patricia Davis, Angie Wallace, uh, she's no longer with SAF, um, so there's no uh, SAF rep. Um, and Louise Barnett's PA, is, has she responded with regards to a SAF rep? Yeah, they're, they're, sorry. Yeah, they're, um, they're currently looking to have a representative on the board when she's coming back to the media. Lovely, thank you. Um, item two on the agenda is disclosure of pecuniary interests. Members are reminded to disclose any pecuniary interests in any matter to be discussed, which is not included in the register of interests, and leave the meeting prior to the uh, matter being discussed. Are there any such pecuniary interests? No. Thank you. Uh, third item, uh, minutes of the last meeting. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just go through the uh, if I can get my mouse back, no, I can't. Um, I'll just go through the pages. Uh, page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, Page nine, page ten, page eleven, page twelve, and page thirteen. Um, and I have a, you know, those minutes have been circulated. So, uh, are we all happy that uh, I sign those as a correct record? Yeah, is that seconded? Fine. OK, I'll now accept these minutes as a true record unless anyone indicates differently. Um, item four on the agenda is public question time. We have one public question which has come from uh, Shrewsbury Friends of the Earth. And I'll read out the, uh, I'll read out the question. Um, and I don't know, Rachel, do you want to read out the response as it's come from you and the uh, Les? Or do you want me to read the response to that? OK, well, the question from uh, shows me Friends of the Earth. Uh, would the Health and Wellbeing Board adopt a proactive stance and push Shropshire Council to do more on air quality improvements and ask for regular updates and review on progress? In order for the reasons um, 
we are asking the question to be, un uh, to be understood. It is necessary to include some background information. As far as we can tell, in the last three years, there are only two mentions of air quality in the agendas available for the board, dating back to January 2019. Uh, this is despite the recognition that air quality has an impact on health and well-being, and that the Health and Wellbeing Board strategy at the time recognised this. The first is this, um, is this extract from the minutes of the Health and Wellbeing Board, the 16th of January 2020. Healthy Lives Update result B, the ongoing prioritisation and work happening, which includes wellbeing support, suicide prevention, county lines and air quality be recognised. The second mention was in the agenda items from September 2021, where the Shropshire Council Officer was proposing action at the Shrewsbury Station AQMA. The latest Health and Wellbeing Board Strategy 2227, page 11, notes the impact of air quality on health, and yet there is no mention of it in the report on it uh, produced for this meeting. Uh, it, it was therefore not deemed to require greater significant reference. Air quality has been illegally high in Shrewsbury and Bridge North since 2010. All the annual reports on air quality have recognised the effect on health and that any pollution is bad for health outcomes, even when it is below legal limits. Structure Council air quality reports since 2017 have proposed consultation. The, uh, the one Structure Council um, proposed action in the September meeting said that Consultation had taken place, yet the action uh, was not endorsed and deferred for more consultation without a deadline. We are now into March. There is no item on the agenda and seemingly no action to report is available. Uh, so now the response from Les Bursgrove, Assistant Director of Health, Environment Protection and Healthy Place and Rachel Robertson, Director of Public Health. Okay, Thank you. So it is correct to say that there are two very localised areas in Shrewsbury and Bridge North that have been affected by levels of nitrogen dioxide above the nation nationally set objective levels for some years. The regulations in force during this period state that councils should be working towards taking measures to reduce levels. It is also true to say that there is no completely safe level of this pollutant, but its presence is unfortunately a byproduct of modern society with all of the activities such as the use of motor vehicles that is accepted. The action you are referring to is be, as being consulted upon was the idea of a trial lane closure within the air quality management area in Shrewsbury. The latest position with, that, with this is that the potential intervention along with other various ideas will be looked at through the development of an options appraisal as part of a creation of a new air quality action plans covering both air quality management areas. It is an intervention if the intervention of a lane closure is modelled as potentially being worthwhile and appears in the air quality action plan, then consultation could then take place. The main purpose of the report for the 2022-27 Joint Shropshire Health and Wellbeing Strategy, which is referred to, is to highlight key changes, additions to the final strategy following the consultation process. As air quality remained, this is why it was not specifically referenced. It certainly merits, merits significance and the report which came to the 8th of July Health and Wellbeing Board meeting stated other focus priorities remain as agreed at the 2019 workshop. Social prescribing, domestic abuse, county lines, alcohol, smoking and pregnancy, food insecurity, suicide prevention, killed and seriously injured and on roads and air quality. Although these are listed, they should not be considered as separate priorities and will form part of the key strategic priorities above. The next stage of the strategy is implementation. The Health and Wellbeing Board Board Agenda Planning will ensure papers related to these specific priorities, which includes air quality, will be brought to the meetings to provide updates and review progress. So the response from the Shropshire Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, the board uh, agrees it will adopt a more proactive stance and air quality will be on the agenda for the next meeting, which will be in May or July. OK, you've been happy with that response. Thank you. Um, so now moving on to item five. Um, so the first item is uh, the ICS involvement strategy um, presentation. Uh, if I can invite Kate Manning, who's online, I believe. Uh, yes, Kate, if uh, you can present, um, you, you can present um, your item to the board. Okay. 
Absolutely no problem. Thank you very much. OK, I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. Can everybody see my screen OK? OK, fabulous. So first of all, I'm Kate Manning. I'm the Senior Engagement and Communications Manager within the CCG. Um, I'm standing in today for Edna Bowenpong. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it. She's in interviews all day, um, but I'll take you through this presentation. And if you've got any questions at the end, I'll attempt to answer them. But if not, I'll take your questions away and I'll come back to you. So this slide, um, it briefly describes the system um, and what we mean by the ICS, ICB and the Integrated Care Partnership. And I'm sure you've, you're all pretty familiar with this. So I'll move on to the next slide, which talks about our associated work, um, which has been developing around involving people and communities. So the integrated care boards as part of their constitution are required to develop a strategy which sets out their intentions and the approach to involving people and communities and this needs to be done by the end of May this year. Um, however, whilst this is something we're required to do, it also feels the right thing to do and at, at the right time um, when our intention is to work more collaboratively as a system um, and that means both with our partners and with our communities. Involvement um, should play a strong part across the different areas of the integrated care system and integrated care partnerships and place based partnerships should have representation from people and communities in setting their priorities and in decision making forums. Integrated care partnerships um, and boards are expected to use insight and intelligence about what people need and their aspirations to support decision making and service quality improvement. So this work, it isn't a starting point for us in Shropshire, Telford and Rekin. So last year, um, I'm sure you're aware of the work that um, was undertaken around the voluntary and community sector memorandum of understanding um, that was developed in partnership with the sector and conversations also began around making involvement in co-production everyday business. So those discussions that started last year and the opportunities to build those relationships and learn from different organisations and partners across the system as to what was already working well has helped us to shape 10 draft principles that will sit at the beginning of this strategy. So these are the, the draft principles and yesterday we held a, a workshop with partners from across the system that included um, partners, project leads, commissioners, engagement leads, volunteer and community groups and patient representatives to test these principles and also shape our approach to involvement which will help inform our strategy going forward. So in terms of the proposed next steps, we're continuing and we have been over the last couple of months um, speaking and reaching out to public and also different groups within communities to find out and listen to them about their experiences of getting involved and how they want to be involved in the work and the future of the integrated care system. We'll also be collating everything that we heard at the workshop yesterday um, and asking those that attended um, to just make sure that what we heard from them is right before it informs our strategy. So we want that to be a, a continuous ongoing engagement process. Um, we also propose to organise a further workshop to really get into the how we put our intentions into practical terms. Um, the national deadlines that we're working towards are quite tight um, so we need to have the final draft of the plan ready for submission to NHSCI by the end of May. So we're hoping that we will have a draft of the strategy to take to the CCG board by the end of April. And that's the end of my presentation. So I just want to invite any questions or comments on that. Thank you, Kate. Um, are, are there any questions at all or comments on the case presentation? No, so uh, 
Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Right. It, it was just a couple of, kind of comments and observations to draw out. So I think, um, obviously, really welcome the paper and welcome the engagement and the kind of direction of travel. Um, and I think it's really, really, obviously, important work that absolutely engagement has to be the heart of everything that we're doing, particularly in the new ICS. And I know a lot of people in this room have been involved in that process. I guess it's just as we can move forward as well, it's just thinking about um, how we engage with people who are representatives of their communities as well as the communities themselves. So thinking about some of our you know, parish councils, some of the members around um, this room and uh, I guess businesses and workplaces and others who represent a uh, part of our communities. And I think whilst I, I appreciate the drivers definitely towards communities and individuals, absolutely support that in core production. Um, I think there's also that element that we just need to make sure that we bring into this. Um, and the other thing was really, it wasn't particularly related to the engagement part of the work, it was just flagging the, the second slide around integrated care partnerships. And I think, it's, um, I know we're discussing that and many people in this room are involved in those discussions through the SHIP and through the integrated care partnerships, but also to flag this board how important that work is, that we've had the new guidance out around integrated, um, the white paper that's just come out around integrated care systems. And I think we're all of the health and wellbeing board within that. Is, um, is really, really important. So I think we need to have more discussion around that at the board at some point. So just to kind of like that um, at this point. But, Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, right, if there are no uh, further questions or comments from uh, members, uh, we'll accept the um, accept the report. Um, I don't think there were recommendations on it, were there? No. So uh, we'll accept that report. Thank, uh, so thank you very much, Kate. Um, mm -hmm. Moving on to, uh, as you uh, sort of uh, mentioned it, Rachel, uh, Shropshire Integrated Place Partnership. Um, I'll move on to Penny to present her report. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I shall attempt to share my screen. So yes, the, the Shropshire Integrated Place Partnership. So just as a reminder, we, it's been a few months since we had a, a presentation or an update from um, the Integrated Place Partnership, partly because of winter pressures. We have um, we did stand down a couple of meetings through December and January um, while the system was grappling with significant issues. And um, so we are in a place where we're catching our breaths a little bit around the Place Partnership. And, um, and so it's a presentation today as, as opposed to a paper with recommendations. Um, I just wanted to put this slide up, which was a reminder of kind of our ethos, how we're working, how we want to support through the place partnership, that really that essence of self care and support. But we need to facilitate that as services and um, a lot of our work goes into that, but also into when people need services that they're able to access those um, for their health and wellbeing needs. We have used the health and wellbeing draft priorities from the health and wellbeing board strategy to as a focus of the uh, ship priorities, um, but also the priorities of the ICS and those uh, those key areas of work that the ICS um, are delivering. So there's real crossover with what we're doing here at the health and wellbeing board, what the ICS is doing and how ship delivers that on the ground in the local place in Shropshire. We have a number of subgroups as well. Uh, we will. I, I also just wanted to flag up that the health and wellbeing strategy, I think, is coming to this board today for ratification. And as such, we'll just take a look at the updates that were made following the engagement around the strategy around the, um, the key focus areas and just see if we need to make any adjustments within SHIP and have that conversation there. But that is work to be done. Um, our terms of reference as well, we had a good discussion at the last SHIP meeting around the terms of reference. Um, we feel that those terms of reference are okay. They're a bit of a holding place, but as the guidance comes down around how we develop our ICS, how the ICP and ICP, the partnerships and boards um, develop, SHIP will need to adjust its uh, delivery and its terms of reference in accordance to what is required and, and the guidance that comes down from NHS England. So we're very much on, and um, we'll be on top of that as the, as the guidance comes down and as we work with, um, as Rachel's already mentioned, the white paper and um, the recently published white paper. One of our key areas of focus is local care and local care has a number of strands. I just wanted to focus on this strand um, for the board today to let you know that there is good progress being made with rapid response. So one of the key areas of work for the ICS is to have more um, 
care out of hospital, make sure that people in their communities and in their homes can be cared for as much as possible. And um, after a good success in Telford and Recon and a pilot in Shropshire, it, um, rapid response is being rolled out across Shropshire. It's an enhancement of the model that was trialled in Telford and it looks at a crisis response. So within two hours, multidisciplinary health and social care teams supporting people at their homes um, and also with urgent care so that they can remain in their usual place of residence, um, which may include uh, care homes. Um, so we've had implementation of SY1, SY2, SY3, um, SY4 and 5 in, in sort of February, January, February, um, and moving to northeast and northwest in spring and summer um, and southwest in June. So um, there's good progress being made there. Um, with regard to personalisation, which is another another part of our local care program, um, personalisation is a, personalised care, I should say, is a real a cornerstone of NHS. Uh, NHS England long term plan and um, it's something that so that certainly the um, voluntary sector and the, the public sector, the, the council can really recognise around to take a personal approach to how we deliver what we do. But in order to do that and, and sort of shift thinking within services, there's quite a strong programme with a, you know, not a, not a huge amount of money, but a bit of money attached to encourage training, to encourage new ways of working that really focus on individuals and individual strengths, so taking that strength based approach and what matters to them. So we've got some specific projects happening in Shropshire, Telford and Recon, and these are around asthma um, and mental health for young people in particular, asthma and mental health. We're using co-production to really understand what we need to deliver across all of those programmes. Um, and social prescribing sits within personalisation as well, but I'll come to that in a bit. Um, and the workforce development, I think it's imp important to notice, note here that I'm not sure this is replicated elsewhere, but we have a real focus around the workforce development and training being available and open to all. So it's open to all voluntary sector, it's open to all social care, all, all public services. So um, and the, the key areas of development there around shared decision making, uh, motivational interviewing, behaviour change um, and health coaching. So looking at that um, much more at, at social need um, and supporting people to support themselves. Um, so prevention, just wanted to highlight to the board that we have um, commissioned a tier two behavioural service for weight management that started in February and we're using the funding um, at, as long as we can. So the last intake is currently going to be the 31st of March. That's open to all uh, primary care uh, referrals. It's um, we're hoping to hear that more funding and will be made available very soon, in which case it will carry on beyond that. Um, and we're also looking to um, enhance that with a Healthy Lives lifestyle offer going forward. So um, and that's something that will, will definitely be available, but that's been scoped and worked on at the moment, particularly around weight um, and smoking. Social prescribing is delivered across all practices in Shropshire with really, really good outcomes. And it's I've noticed that I've in, we've in, <laughs> included the outcomes around that in both the um, in this report. So I won't go into great detail and in the report of the Joint Commissioning Group. But we also have a pilot happening in the southwest of the county with um, really positive results so far around that really understanding what the needs of children and young people are taking a, a two pronged approach in the southwest. One is having a one to one um, link worker offer for children and young people to have that one to one support and the other is um, the kind of additional activity available for young people with a well-being approach so um, where people have uh, where children and young people have kind of they get to take additional activity but also those delivering that additional activity recognize the need to support their uh, resilience and their mental health in particular um, so I'm just going to skip through these, but just to show we have good referral rates for the year and increasing. Um, and so these show. Um, sorry, got a little bit excited there. Um, yeah, and it sort of demonstrates the referrals by practices, but also we take referrals from outside um, GP practices as well. This is demonstrates our um, our data, which shows us whether or not we're doing a good job. So when people's a reduction is good, as it says there, so people we take an understanding of people's concerns and then on a follow up, we understand if their concerns are less or more. And you can see there that they're less for the most part, which is good. 
Um, and the same with using the ONS measures. So our life satisfaction, um, anxiety, and how happy you feel. And again, um, the top three, an increase is good, and the bottom one, a decrease is good. Um, but these will be circulated for people to look at in more detail. Um, and as Rachel said, involvement is really important to ship, and we've been working closely with the ICS around that involvement um, and developed the, the, you know, the second of the three workshops that have already been in place. Um, and the, the outputs of the workshops that have happened, again, these have, you know, the ship haven't delivered these, it has been the ICS, but has been a memorandum of understanding with the voluntary sector, principles of involvement, and then of course there was a workshop yesterday, um, some more work as Kate talked about already, will come from that. Um, and just finally to say there are developing programmes of work that we'd like to bring back to the board. Again, these are linked with the joint commissioning group, uh, joint commissioning paper that, have, um, that you'll see next. Um, children and young people, so um, some specific work there. We are working on the metrics for SHIP, which really need to dovetail with the metrics for inequalities and the Health and Wellbeing Board. That's a work in progress. We will receive and have received and will continue to receive uh, reports at SHIP around mental health and dementia. Um, and end of life and enhanced health and care homes as part of the local care programme as well, um, which I'd be pleased to update the board another time on. Thank, Thank you very much, much Andy, uh, for that. Um, just one question from me. Um, you mentioned with regards to uh, CIP and uh, asthma. Uh, I just wonder if there's any uh, intervention with regards to diabetes. Or am I asking a silly question? <laughs> for children and young people? No. no, I think it's a really good question. So um, there's there's work going on at the moment that's connecting with uh, as a system we were asked to look at what we delivered around uh, weight management programs um, and we're doing some work as a system also to look at how that connects with diabetes and we've had um, so there is work happening in the background but there's nothing I can report specifically today it's not currently part of the personalization program but we are encouraging clinical staff and all staff working with children who at all people who are on the diabetic register to undertake the personalization training so that kind of that what matters to them approach so it's in development but i can't report anything specific today but i think it's a really important one oh, thank you um right uh, are there any uh, questions at all uh yeah, cecilia uh, first of all chairman can i apologize for being late i got stuck in a traffic jam the like of which one seldom sees in Shropshire, but um, that was I sitting in the middle of it, so I do apologise for that. Um, I, can I please ask some really basic questions? And will you forgive me if I do that? First of all, I'm interested to know what you mean exactly by the southwest of the county. And I'll tell you why, because uh, I regard the southwest as the this, this sort of the west, uh, west of the A49, if you like. Now, my patch is just east of the A49 and shares an awful lot of characteristics with those uh, uh, areas to the southwest. So I'm quite keen that uh, southwest doesn't exclude parts of the more southeasterly area as well, which covers a huge sort of uh, um, rural area which goes all the way around the Clee Hills, Brown Clee. So uh, could, could I have some, some um, reassurance on that? And the other thing that I'm, I'm very interested in is are we happy with, and um, um, excuse me if this is a basic uh, and ignorant question, are we happy with the resilience of our GP practices? Because there was certainly concern earlier about the fact that some of the, and, and again, this was in, you know, in the southwest area, there was certainly concern about, about the fact that it looked as though some of the uh, GP practices might be vulnerable might not have enough, enough uh, uh, doctors, staff. Um, are we happy now that, that, that they can actually deliver on these programmes effectively because they are, you know, that they've got the staffing they need? Thank you. Um, okay, is it possible for me to answer question one and then ask colleagues to answer question two? I know we've got Dr Pepper on the on teams and we've got um, Mark Randolph here. So is, if that's possible, because I can't answer question two. With regards to um, the South West, South East, it, I understand what you're saying completely. And I think that there is, the, you know, people are people and communities are communities and we might draw a line down the middle, but they don't, people don't necessarily. Yeah, so that totally makes sense to me. We are delivering service, but at, at some 
stage to carve up and deliver services, we, we do draw these lines. With regards, when I talk about the Southwest, it's generally in line with the primary care network, in the, which is sort of, like you said, down the A49 and then west, um, and, and takes into account those, those GP practices in that area of work. Um, but we aim to deliver our work across all of Shropshire, so we don't want to make those, but sometimes when we start with pilots, as an example, like the other social prescribing, we've done it in that particular area because it's an area that A, the primary care network was keen to have a social prescribing young person lead. Um, and it was it was an area that the data said we, we needed to do something about, in particular young people living in those rural areas. So, um, so I, I understand what you're saying, and I, and I think we need to be mindful of that all the time. Um, in, the, in the services that we deliver. Um, but we are trying to follow some methodology behind de developing and delivering services. Does that make sense? Yes, that's it does. Right. I, I, think, I, think, I think my concern is that is that we've got, we have GP practices in Ludlow, we've got GP practices in Craven Isles and Church Stratton. We've got nothing in the rural hinterland until you get up to Ditton Priors. Yeah. And then there's a practice up there. Now that actually covers a, a big area, yeah. as you can imagine. And, and, and that's really why I asked the question, because it seems to me that I know that that, um, that the Ludlow provision uh, is is extremely good. Yeah. Uh, and the Craven Arms provision seems to be good as well. Um, but it's it's more about what's going on in those rural areas and their access problems, which which does concern me and always has done, actually. I, yeah, I agree. And, and with transportation as an example, exactly. it's coming up time and time again around yep. children and young people in particular. So, and and I think we can't differentiate between you'll have the same issues, like you say, in your very rural constituency as we will do in the very corner of the southwest. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. And uh, partners to answer part two. And forgive me, partners, for asking, yeah. as I say. <laughs> Basic questions. No, do you, sorry. Do you want to just ask it again? Yeah. Yeah. I was listening to Penny's very good answer on this. I was I, I was particularly thinking about the resilience of GP practices within those very rural areas, or those GP practices that are, tend to be based in town, but are having to deal with very wide catchments. That's that's probably a better a, a better way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, I, I I actually don't see the resilience question as urban and rural, I'm afraid. I see it as I'm really worried about yeah, primary care that, GP practices. No, no, that, that, that's fine. So, um, I'd be happy with that. Uh, <laughs> there is a, there are significant issues with the attractiveness of primary care and particularly being a GP as a profession. Yes. We are in a very competitive market. We don't have enough GPs. We don't have as many as we'd like. Um, enough haven't been trained over the last probably 10 years. Um, there's a lot of work going on around the wider primary health care team, so one of the things that we're very keen to do is to help patients understand that perhaps seeing a pharmacist, a nurse, a physio is not second class treatment if you've not seen the doctor. Um, I always go back to my old grand, if she went to hospital and didn't see the professor, which is often a man, I have to say, if you didn't see the professor, it didn't count, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it, it, it's, it's attitude of a, of a particular time, which is why I refer to my own family in that. Um, so there's more work to be done with patients to help them understand that, uh, because the patient experience when they do receive that kind of care is very good. But um, sorry to, to kind of not, I'm not avoiding your question because I do, we do worry and we do think a lot about rural deprivation, rural inequality, as well as um, urban inequality. So please don't think we don't. But the wider general practice point is a much more concerning point about all general practice as opposed to um, you know, kind of particular issues. There's some, we, we are very fortunate though in saying that in Shropshire's health and really in terms of the quality of the primary care that we've got. And if you look at the CQC uh, view of that, it's only one measure, but actually the quality of what's provided is very good. Uh, and we need to keep building on that. But to make my point again, um, I am very worried about our GPs, the pressures on them, the attractiveness of those roles. And if we can't, um, and this isn't a, a local point, I make mean, this is a national point, if we can't make primary care more attractive um, for doctors to come into and work and stay in, we are going to end up in a real mess in terms of the way that NHS care is provided. Yeah. Um, it, 
Ju just sorry, Chair, just just if I could just add to that. Can you use your yeah, sure. sorry? No, I mean, one of the reasons one of the reasons why I brought this up is because we have such a large elderly population in those rural areas and and it's for them very often access is difficult, you know, because then some of them may not be uh, able to uh, uh, drive cars or may not have have cars and that aren't, as you know, very many other alternatives for getting oneself around in those rural areas. So that's that's why, I, you know, I, that's really uh, was at the root of my question and I should have mentioned that before. Yeah, I mean, okay. uh, uh, so I would agree with your point, but um, again, I'd probably counter it by saying we're worried about access right across the county, both again, both urban and rural. I, I, I respect your point about particularly if you, if you need a face to face appointment, um, then access can be an issue. Um, but I think we probably also agree that making an appointment, getting through on the phone is an issue both in urban yes, practices yes. and in rural practices. Yes. And again, that's something that we're working really hard on. I mean, the pandemic has brought forward, I mean, things like telephone appointments two years ago, were, they weren't rare, but they certainly weren't as common as they are now. Actually, the patient satisfaction around telephone appointments is incredibly high because it, it means often people don't have to travel uh, for a five minute appointment, sit in a waiting room full of um, lots of other ill people and we knew through the pandemic ill people with COVID um, and actually people being sorted out efficiently, clearly and well. Um, so the thankfully the telephone appointment system uh, is here to stay and we need to keep building on it but we need to make sure that we're not creating the digital inequality mm. by doing that. So it can be managed with some thought. We are seeing the number of face-to-face -face appointments begin to return uh, to pre-pandemic levels, but I'll just add that. On top of that, GPs are doing more um, virtual telephone consultations than ever before. So the actual number of appointments that we're operating across the system is way more than we were doing even two years ago, which is back to my original point, which is sitting in a room on your own or with people coming in every five minutes all day is not terribly attractive medicine often. And so we've got to try and strike this balance. So you, you, you make very good points, but um, uh, there's, there's lots to be done. But I think it does need to be done very thoughtfully. Really. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. I apologise for taking up so much. No, that's time. okay. I, d I don't know if you um, want to bring uh, John Pepper. If uh, John, if you've got any comments at all that you wanted to make on that? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> I mean, not um, wishing to repeat everything that Mark said, which I totally agree with um, um, across the board. I mean, what I would say is that uh, I'd agree that in terms of your, your the original question um, as to sort of workforce and concern of GP numbers, I think this is not just a, uh, an issue for our CCG, it's a national issue. You know, we've seen a, a drop in the total number of full time equivalent GPs over the last five years. And, and I know that what I would say is that locally, there's a big effort to try and support um, the workforce. I know that the primary care team in the CCG, for instance, um, does a lot of work to try and support, to encourage um, retention of the workforce locally. And also practices are now increasingly working together across primary care networks and involving, involving other professionals, employing other professionals to help to help support really the workload that would have otherwise traditionally fallen simply on the shoulders of GPs. The, the workforce that delivers primary care is now much broader and I think that that hopefully will go a long way to supporting the sustainability of primary care given the current pressures that um, that Mark's very um, eloquently described. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, thank you. Um, OK, if there's no further questions or comments. Um, uh, again, uh, I accept the, uh, the paper. We're happy to accept the paper that um, and is just uh, presented. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on now to uh, the next item is the Joint Commissioning Board Better Care Fund. And uh, this paper will be presented by Laura Tyler, LT. The floor is yours. Good morning, all. Um, I'm Laura Tyler, Assistant Director for Joint Commissioning. So I'm going to take it. So, do you want me to show that? Has everybody got a copy in front of them, or should I, is it better if I share? 
I think if you share because uh, anybody uh, online, uh, you know, if they haven't got a copy, uh, they'll be able to share yeah. that as well. Thank you. You can do that. So I'm presenting um, the, an update on the Better Care Fund and some of the joint um, commissioning work um, that we've been doing certainly over the last couple of months. So the report today um, talks about um, the approval of our Better Care Fund plan that um, we presented back in November, talks about some of the work we're doing in relation to some of the system pressures and collaborative response to um, ensure flow through the hospital. Um, an update on um, some of the work programmes that are going through the commissioning delivery group as we speak um, and some of the work that, that Penny will, will pick up a bit later on in the report around the progress on prevention and early help work and, and then again picking up on some of the social prescribing and some good news around how that's working. So today, um, just in terms of an update on, on, the, on the Better Care Fund, uh, Better Care Plan, um, you, many of you will remember we brought um, the, the, the plan um, for approval back in November, seems like quite a long time ago now. Um, that has subsequently received um, approval in January. We discussed the, the new metrics that were um, part of, of, of the new plan and looking at how we set those targets. So at the moment we are still awaiting the outcome of where we are with them, but I suspect um, we, we, we will be difficult to meet those, but we described that I think at the previous meeting, the difficulties around setting new metrics on the unknown at the time. And then we had a little thing called Omicron in between. So that certainly has uh, played a, a part in and in, in, um, on those those targets that we'll see at the end of the, um, the year. So just in terms of um, where we're moving to next with the better care um, plan. We I went to a regional meeting um, uh, probably a couple of weeks back now. We are hoping that we will have some um, some oversight and a new some updates on um, early in the new year. So rather than have uh, the, the framework in November, which is what we usually get, so it's always behind. We're hopefully going to have it in advance, but uh, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Um, on that, there was a lot of discussion around what Section 75 agreement um, was going to look like. The plan at the moment is that there will be a new, a such, a, a new Section 75 template which will come out. Um, so we will keep an eye on that and, and then there will probably be an update will come to um, a future Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, just in relation to system pressures and response, because that um, has been obviously a lot of the focus and targeting of, of, of um, the areas of our, of our teams at the moment. And so we know we've seen significant um, challenges across both health and social care um, to ensure um, system flow and discharges from the hospital. So the team have been, work, been working really hard um, to support um, system escalation calls, working across seven days a, work, a week, um, supporting um, those bronze, silver and gold meetings to ensure um, system flow. We just made reference to there across the, the workforce pressures again, you know, I think picking up on some of the points already made around um, some of the workforce pressures and in, in, uh, right across the different areas. And again, you know, Omicron really pushed, um, you know, and, inc and increased those pressures um, during November onwards. Um, and we are starting to see certainly a, a um, some blue sky now um, and things are, are starting to improve. I have to say, whilst that has been particularly difficult in terms of the challenges around capacity um, and, and obviously the mandatory vaccinations, which at the time of um, was was in place and certainly would have been coming in this year. Thankfully, that that has now um, stopped. Um, I have to say, you know, considering these challenges, you know, the team have gone above and beyond to ensure capacity has always been available and that we are supporting that flow, thinking very creatively, looking at how we increase capacity across bed, across the domiciliary care, looking at different um, uh, models and approaches and certainly working incredibly hard. So I do want to formally put on record how hard the teams have worked to support that. Um, there's a lot of conversations now about what what we do and how that and what that modeling is going to look like moving forward. So we're working um, certainly across the system on that as we speak um, and, and thinking very differently and creatively um, and thinking about how we will meet challenges um, moving forward. Um, just so as part of that, um, you know, we've got a, you know, a really good system in terms of the voluntary and community sector supporting um, 
uh, whether they're preventing admissions in the first place, admission avoidance or support in discharge. We've got several projects there. Um, we will be reviewing those um, in light of what we do for, for next winter and certainly how we um, you know, engage and support and have the voluntary and community sector supporting the system. And again, you know, putting on record a huge thank you for, for the work that they do. They're an, an incredible um, contribution um, from that system from that system. Um, we've talked about some additional um, we've put additional resources um, to support it. We've moved a heck of a lot of um, resources actually to support um, discharge um, and step down provision including across our starts teams um, and you know social worker at the front door etc so we're again we're looking at what works and and thinking about what we do in the future as i've just described just in terms of joint delivery group updates um, we've got a number of projects that have been coming through that that um, will be that we put out commissioner will certainly will be one is our independent living service so we're looking at um, recommissioning that on a short-term basis and aligning that with several other projects that will come on stream later on next year one of the things that we're doing around the joint commissioning approach is very much thinking as a system how we can align you know health and social care projects commission services to ensure they're efficient and effective and meeting the needs of our communities um, the other area we're looking at um, so we've just um, approved a recommendation of a recommissioning of a local um, learning disability care home contract so that um, is, is currently out um, and also um, we're looking at how we um, work as underway to scope out potential delivery models to recommission Health Watch, which is obviously a statutory service and looking at um, some early stage conversations with stakeholders um, certainly taking place over the previous months and certainly the um, coming months about what that could look like. So that's quite um, an exciting piece of work. And then finally, really, the Joint um, Commissioning uh, Delivery Group is also looking at the development of a market position statement. And so um, for Shropshire, um, our, uh, we have got currently got a market position statement. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically a position statement to inform our trends, demands and our commissioning intentions and models moving forward. It's very much written for our providers and gives them an insight in terms of what we want to do as we as we move forward and where the demands and trends we think um, and the models of approach that we think as a system um, we want to see put in place. So that's really um, quite a large piece of work um, and, and quite an exciting piece of work, really. It will be a very much a system piece of work. Um, and so we'll be setting up various workshops um, looking at what that might look like. So um, the idea um, at the moment, we are working to a, um, a timescale of September and that along with the fair cost of care exercise we've got to do with the market both have to be complete for September 2022. So there are quite short time frames on that, but we are looking at, at, at progressing that at a, quite a pace. Um, and also as part of that, we will then pull out some of the key elements and, and look, and we're working with um, Telkin and Rican um, local authority and obviously CCG to have an overarching um, ICS market position statement, which again is, 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 really, is really good. Um, and I think is really timely. Um, Penny, do you want me to hand over this to, to you to do this update? Sure, thank you. I'll, um, I'll take this as read um, for the most part. Um, I, we have talked about social prescribing already, but this is an important piece of work that, as it says there, there's, uh, you know, senior leaders have got together to discuss in the wake of COVID how we can support our young people better. Um, and there is some, um, we've started out by having a number of workshops and we actually had this week on Tuesday really an, another really positive workshop where we're really starting to form ideas around the, that best start in life, supporting schools, triage and, um, and stepping stones, which is around social care in particular. Um, but also recognising that we need to broaden those workshops out to involve more of our health colleagues. I think we really wanted to get to grips with education, our early help offer in the local authority and also what was going on around prevention with um, within public health and social prescribing. And now once now we really need to kind of look at, well, we have there's a range of opportunities around these um, these areas of work and actually in order to make the most of those opportunities we need to make sure we're working collectively as a system with our um, really much more closely with our NHS colleagues. So um, 
it would be good at some stage to bring a more detailed report to the Health and Wellbeing Board, but I don't think we're quite ready for that yet. There's sort of more details around that, some of that planning. Thank you. Thanks, Penny. Um, so it, just in terms of um, some risks and opportunities, obviously, um, and we're looking at um, you know reviewing the Better Care Fund and and what um, that's going to look like in the future. We don't know um, if nationally they will change that. We suspect not. Um, but again, we're just waiting for further information on that, and and also report back once we know a bit more a, a few more details around that. Um, and and I always said you know. The, the, the looking at what that the new met metrics will look like um, and the implications of anything new that will come through. Um, on the report, um, we've just put around the um, just some of the um, information around the funding available on that. And that is it from me, really, um, unless anybody's got any questions. Just a little stop tool. Right, thank you then. And, uh, and Penny. Uh, right, do we have any questions at all? Uh, Yes, Tanya. Thank you, Chair. Just a few comments, if I may. Um, so first of all, a huge thank you to everyone involved in the response over this last winter. It's been an incredibly challenging winter uh, from our community and put on record a heartfelt thanks to everybody that has worked above and beyond in supporting our residents of Shropshire. Um, it's great to see the update and see what I'm social prescribing, so thank you for that. Um, I think it would be really good for the next Health and Wellbeing Board Chair to have a paper specifically on CYP and social prescribing. Mm -hmm. I'm interested also about how we interconnect this wider as active housing colleagues, just thinking around um, asthma as an example, in terms of how we track back to children in particular um, that have got asthma and their, their living and housing conditions. Um, it's great to see the progress on CYP and prevention and early help. Um, it's an area that I'm very passionate about and I know as a health and wellbeing board we've talked about at great length. So again, it would be really important for this board to have regular updates in terms of implementation. And then finally, um, pilots are great, but I'm interested about how we upscale that pilot so the whole of the community of Shropshire benefits from um, this great work. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't know, uh, was that... Did you want to respond to that? Uh, uh, sorry, Laura. Laura, sorry, yeah. not late. Yeah, Laura. I'll take. Do you want to respond to that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I absolutely agree with, with what Tanya said. And I think there's there's a real um, much more joining in, in particularly around children, young people and adults. And I think that's, you know, we're very fortunate to have a, a new newly formed people's directorate. You know, part of my role is around aligning some, especially the uh, the children and young people's commissioning areas into, you know, and having that unified and joined up. Um, yeah, and, and and I think the work that we're doing across um, with with Penny and the team is is really positive. I think there's some really good conversations around that, um, and also um, we're starting to link in very much within the housing um, as well. So thinking about what the needs are and future planning around that. So there's a lot of work ongoing with that. Um, I think specifically the pilot work is probably Penny's area within the social prescribing bit. But uh, you know, I think once we get to a point where you know that that you know we're seeing some really good outcomes on you know we're looking at what that model is going to look like across the county unless it penny or, or rachel want to comment on that can, can i just come back on that yeah just to say yeah i mean i totally agree and we'd love to see a, a, a county-wide the idea behind the social prescribing in the southwest for children and young people was testing to see what would work we had a really we have a really successful adult program and we weren't sure because we hadn't done it before what would work for children and young people so it was important to start small um, and we have some really good learning from that um, and the thing that's exciting about it is that it has a totally joint effort between the nhs the voluntary sector and um and Shropshire council so um, that is great, that's really exciting, but then sometimes to move things forward and develop them further, you need agreement from all of those areas as well. So, <laughs> so it makes it slightly more complicated. So asking for any influence, any any of our um, health and wellbeing board members can bear on, um, you know, taking that social prescribing model elsewhere. Okay, Rachel, you wanted to. Thanks, yeah, I mean, I, I guess my comments were, were, were related. This is a really good specific example, but it was just generally the minister 
goes through to echo Tanya's point about how hard everybody has worked over the winter and how uh, how everybody's pulled together across and worked in such different ways and you know worked seven days a week not to, in response to Omicron but just winter pressures generally um, you know so a huge thank you to everybody I think there's a huge amount learned from that and actually we'll be in next winter before we know it unfortunately and we expect when we come back and look at COVID flu everything else unfortunately next winter and I don't mean to be the bearer of doom will probably much be much worse so there's an awful lot we need to put in place now and there's really good programs in here and and work that's been put in place the kind of the partnership work in the seven day um working the the voluntary sector work but all of this needs to be resolved properly and i think we need to have some really honest conversations and you know the social subscriber pilot's a good example where we're trying to collect evidence to show that these make a difference and we all know and we've said as a board prevention is a great thing to do early health intervention is much better to do but that does require a shift and we collectively as a board that's a really big challenge but we do need to look at how we invest in that and i think the pandemic's unearthed a lot of challenges for us and this, these are the difficult questions we need to look at so looking at the paper that laura's put together the really good examples are in that how do we make get ready for next winter and how do we really start to invest in some of this so i think it's it's we are looking to try and do that. We're trying to collate the evidence to show what works and we need to learn very quickly from what does work. And then, as Tanya said, how do we upscale that? And it's not just for one organisation or one part of an organisation to do it, it's how we do it together. Thank um, Mark, you said you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I, uh, <clears throat> just two quick points, really. First of all, to extend Tanya's thanks to the team, personally to Laura in particular, uh, who's been a stalwart right through uh, what's been a very long winter and I know it's not over yet <laughs> uh, but Laura just from the, the health system to say thank you so much for your really hard work often what's been over seven days a week and I know you sit on top of a, a very good team of colleagues and uh, and people that work for you but from us thank you very much and um, the second point actually is building on something that's been said already which is about particularly about some of the issues that we've faced this winter in terms of uh, the care home market and the domiciliary care um, uh, market in terms of its resilience and um, uh, it's been a it's been a very very difficult winter for staff absence um, and uh, facing the kind of triple the triple threat of the usual winter pressures one um, COVID two by the way it's not gone away yet we've still got lots of patients in hospital with COVID COVID two and uh, staff absence which I have to say is, was really probably the most difficult thing to deal with because however creative and flexible we all are, if there are no people, then there is no service. And, and we forget our peril as we talk in our jargon, and I do this too, that pretty well everything we do as a health and care system <laughs> involves people providing services and care to other people. So I would really like to take um, Rachel's point on and echo it in terms of, I think, by the time we get to the next health and wellbeing board and certainly the one after we need a really robust and clear set of agreements between us about how we're going to approach next winter given the director of public health just made some very clear statements which i totally echo about beginning to already worry about next winter being potentially worse than this and rachel i, I really do agree with you i think the evidence points to that one of the things that i think we do need to think about is our is our willingness to intervene in in, in a market uh, in terms of the care home market and how we might think about that uh, i don't mean at the detriment of the providers we've got we've got some very very good providers but how do we really support them so that we can continue to keep flow and finally i'll finish with this chair which is just to make the point the reason why we can't sometimes get people into primary care or significantly um, collected, uh, picked up, cared for by an ambulance or offloaded at hospital is because the hospital is full. The hospital is full because the community services are full, full and the community hospitals are full because uh, the care home market, the domiciliary care market is saturated. This is a really complex chain and um, we need every part of it to really think differently. So I think there's a, there's a really interesting thing for us to work through in terms of what our, uh, I'll use this language again, our level of intervention might be, particularly as we face um, uh, homes and services closed with infection and staff risk. So I think there's one for us there to really work together on. But again, thank you to Laura for uh, hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, uh, John, did you uh, 
Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. And echo the, the sentiments that, that many have already expressed. And Laura, I just wanted the opportunity to say, you know, thank you for the work um, that you've done here, but particularly just to highlight that that part about um, social prescribing for our children and young people. You know, we've, we've talked just now about the, the impact that the pandemic's had in so many areas. And, and of course, it's had a profound impact on our children and young people. So it was really just to be really supportive of that suggestion um, of, of, of bringing back that paper to the board, you know, for a full report really regarding the social prescribing and the opportunities that that presents um, it, to help deliver that service for our, for our children and young people. Um, so really supportive of that direction of travel. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Um, if there are no further comments or questions, um, we'll move on to the recommendations. Uh, we have here recommendations 2-1, uh, 2, two, two three, and 2-4. Um, are we happy that uh, those, if we have a, a show of hands, uh, to agree to those recommendations? Yes. That's all in favour. All right, thank you very much indeed, uh, Laura. I got it right that time. <laughs> OK, moving on uh, on the agenda now to item six, um, which is Shropshire 22, 27 uh, Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy. Val, to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd just like to um, give a, a report on the final strategy. Um, as you was has come back to the board before with the, when we have the draft strategy and discussion around uh, with, the, with the board and wider people, um, the joint health and wellbeing strategies are a statutory duty of health and wellbeing boards, and this is the final document. Um, so the draft strategy went for public and stakeholder consultation, and we used um, a mixture of an online survey, but also um, through attending partnership boards. Um, we had um, a learning and physical physical disability adults group. They engaged um, with, with questions around the strategy. Um, we also went to different partnership boards, such as the Mental Health Partnership Board, Early Help. Carers Partnership Board and we had um, 172 responses to the surveys, most of which were 85% of members of the public. Um, we recognise all that, right, so this was about 350 people overall who gave their views. Um, I know this may seem relatively small, but it's a big ask to be looking at a strategy and actually I think, I, I feel that is pretty, that is pretty good um, amount of people overall. Um, you know, work is ongoing um, through the implementation and I'm sure getting lots of views back and, and, and feedback um, about how it's going through the strategy um, as well. So um, that's another opportunity. We are also doing ongoing work with children and young people um, with engagements. So um, again, that will, that will feed into the strategy um, progression. Just want to say really grateful to Shropshire people for giving their feedback. You know, it does take time. <laughs> um, and we, we're very grateful to those who either took time to speak to us at partnership boards, said, um, you know, got a uh, mass there, um, volunteers to talk to people in their groups um, and, and the public and stakeholders who responded to the survey. So um, from this, um, the report was published, which is on the Shropshire Council website, which is the findings of the, the, um, the survey. I won't go through that in detail because I've just summarised that. But what came out were um, for the strategic priorities, there were things that needed greater reference. So in terms of, um, I'm going to scale, I'm not going to go through all of this, but reducing inequalities, disabilities, housing and digital by default came out as concerns and of course the impact of financial pressures um, which obviously we've seen with the impact of Covid. Um, going down just picking key priorities, um, healthy way to physical activity, um, food and exercise costs, um, mental health access and waiting times and stigma came out um, through, the, through the findings too. In workforce, low wages and lack of opportunity, such as um, young people leaving the county because of um, perceived lack of well, because of lack of opportunities to progress. Um, 
other areas, key areas in terms of priorities that were cited as missing were substance misuse. We had alcohol in there, but also substance misuse was saying that really needs to be in. And also safe active travel and safe roads and a greater reference to loneliness and suicide prevention. Suicide prevention is one of the priorities, but, you know, I've put that in there because people were, were, were you know, actually stressing that. Um, the vision um, we put for Shropshire people originally was to be the healthiest and most fulfilled in England and feedback from that was that is perhaps pretty ambitious and is it realistic. So that has been changed to for Shropshire people to be healthy and fulfilled. In the um, report it gives the key changes which is on a page just for ease of reference and for people to see. And what's happened with these is these have been weaved into the final strategy. So next steps in terms of the strategy are um, the Healthy Life Steering Group, which is the prevention uh, programme of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Those meetings have restarted and those priorities are going to start coming through that. There'll be a project management approach to priorities. So the next, this is right, what we're going to do in terms of implementation. But again, we know that joint working is absolutely key to that. You know, we all have our part to play. We know that, that's why we're all here. Um, and that's going to be um, absolutely vital. Um, and also in terms of the different priorities for the agenda planning, we'll ensure that the different priorities are reported on, um, on, a, on a rotational basis so that everything we're saying is a priority in that strategy and uh, there is some form of reporting on that. So in terms of recommendations, um, I'll just scroll back. Um, this is that the board agrees the final 2022 to 27 joint health and wellbeing strategy. Um, and we take joint, joint ownership for progression and implementation and health and lives reporting will start coming back to the board as well so that will be another more reporting mechanism so thank you that's it chair thank you Val. are there any uh, questions or comments for that uh yes Kirsty. Sorry, I just want to say thank you to Val for a comprehensive report and just looking at figure one as you put at a glance, I just thought it was really great to see all our priorities and everything that we've discussed over the last few months, obviously since we've been a new member of the board, but interestingly we put what we've got to keep a focus on, which is great to see the children's mental health in there and then, you know, on the right hand side of that, that figure, what we've got to look at and change, I thought that was really, really helpful as well, so it gives us a focus and priorities and all. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done. Thanks. Are there any other comments or questions for Val? Yes, Penny. Thank you. Can I just say, um, can I just echo that? I think it's, um, Val has done an enormous amount of work on this and she's really worked hard to include the views of all, all our partners and people. So, yeah, thank you very much, Val. Great. Okay, it's all uh, congratulations to, uh, <laughs> to ourselves. <laughs> start today, isn't it? Good. Um, right, we've got the uh, recommendation there. Um, are we happy that uh, if there's no objections that we uh, accept those recommendations? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Val. Um, moving on to item seven on the agenda, which is the um, oh god, I'm gonna trip over this now. Musculoskeletal transformation <laughs> program. I think I got it right. Did I? Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's um, uh, Terry. Terry, hi Terry, welcome. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. Can you hear so, me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you if you'd like to present your report. Hi, yes, um, hopefully you've received our presentation in your packs. I'm just checking. Yes, brilliant. Thank you. So we're just here to present today, which is on the musculoskeletal MSK for short uh, transformation programme, which is happening both across Shropshire and Telford and Rekin. Um, you can see in the pack that we've given you an overview of the programme, some of the key data and the next steps. This is very much about a vision around ensuring patients can receive the right care at the right time, first time in the right place. And at the moment we have we don't have a standardisation referral route or anything for our citizens. So we're trying to make sure that our outcomes are the same wherever you enter the services. So we've put in the pack the reasons for the change, which is on slide two. 
Um, I, I won't go through each of the slides because I presume that you've read them and can see where they're up to. You can see that it impacts a large element of our populations and we're very much focused on um, citizens journeys through our MSK services. Um, and we've done quite a lot of patients and public engagement through surveys and patient groups to um, instigate what model that we should have in place that meets their needs really. So that's our reasons for change. You will note from slides three and slides four that we are phasing the programme. Um, year one is very much focused on what we would describe as the front end of um, the patient's pathway, so how patients are referred. Um, at the moment, patients can enter our MSK services through lots of different um, doorways, for want of a better word, and we're suggesting that one single point of access to ensure consistency in care would be much better, and that's the feedback we've had from our patients. Um, also helping patients to manage their conditions much better and working much more in multidisciplinary um, methods. So in phase one, that we're focusing very much more on the front end. As we move into phase two and three, that's focusing on orthopaedics, outpatients and primary care and working through. Um, you can see on slide five, we presented what the benefits would be. Um, with, as you can tell, the main element of this is a much more joined up model of MSK across the whole Shropshire, Telford and Rekin, one referral pathway um, with a point of advice and guidance for everyone to access, um, much more oversight of patients so we're able to impact on any inequalities or issues that need addressing, um, a triage team that will be made up of different specialists so we can ensure that patients are directed to the right service at the right time and much more passing of information through those services um, and hopefully that people will have earlier access to therapy support. Um, hopefully that sets out the benefits um, and what's happened so far. This has been work that's been ongoing. I picked up this work in March 21 um, when it was already underway. Um, we've called it a transformation programme. There is a number of partners across our system that are working together um, to ensure our patients get the best service. We're starting phase one, but obviously due to the impact of um, COVID, particularly Omicron, we've had to slow our implementation date, but we plan to implement this year. Um, as you can tell, we've been working with Health Watch colleagues and representatives to make sure that the views and experiences of people who use our services are included to shape those programmes. That's included both surveys, um, as I said, going to patient panels. Um, also, we've done some process mapping and testing those process maps with our patients. What we see is that actually how it feels for you piece. And then on, on page se seven of the pack is the roadmap. So obviously, because we're making some changes to services we're presenting to you today, I hope that gives you all the information that you would need, but happy to take any questions. Right, thank you, Terry. Um, do we have any uh, questions at all for Terry? Or any comments or observations? No, right. Well, thank you very much for that, Terry, uh, for the report. So, uh, you know, we'll uh, accept the uh, your report. Thank you. Um, moving on to item eight, which is uptake data for childhood routine vaccinations. Um, this will be uh, Stephanie. Is it Steph? She's Hello. Yes. Ah, hi, Steph. Yeah, right. Okay, um, Steph, if you'd like to uh, present the paper. Thank you. OK, so we're bringing this paper back to the board today. It is it has been brought to the uh, this subject has been brought to the board previously, and this is just by way of assurance. Um, sorry, I wonder, sorry, just interrupting one sec. Could, could you um, share your screen? Um, if not, I'll the document. If, if not, uh, it, it's OK, we'll get Val to, uh, to share. I just think um, I didn't make, I haven't been making sure I that the I don't think you've got that presentation. Have we not? Oh. Uptake for childhood routine. It's a report. It's, it's a report. It's, it's, a, it's a written report. report by way of assurance, Chair. I'm, I can try and upload it file i don't know if you could do it your end yeah, um, i think it, oh, sorry it's not a presentation is it no it's a paper no, it's, yeah. it's, 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 okay. okay sorry yeah okay carry on is that okay thank Ignore. you <laughs> so 
the paper has been brought previously in terms of um, measles, mumps and rubella is, is not a new new topic. However, you may be aware in the media it's been quite fronted as of late um, and it's a very important topic around the need to promote the uptake of vaccination for measles, mumps and rubella. Uh, measles is a potentially fatal uh, illness and can affect children um, and does affect children and we previously had achieved some elimination statuses in nationally. However, following the pandemic, um, we've seen a, an increased decline in the number of parents and carers taking their children to receive their MMR for short vaccines. So the Office for Health and Health Improvement and Disparities, o Disparities OHID, and the UK Health Secretary security agency the UK HSA have launched a new print campaign which was launched in February last month and that runs until the 14th of March and there is lots of promotional material and resources available on the back of recent uh, data which shows uh, this decline in the number of vaccines and the uptake from uh, parents and carers uh, promoting uh, encouraging their children to take this vaccine so the aim of this uh, report is to hopefully support the increase in the number of people getting their children vaccinated for MMR through boosting parent and carer com uh, confidence through promotional materials such as these. Uh, there are a number of children as well, it's worth highlighting, who have received maybe just one dose of the MMR vaccine, which means they will only be uh, partially vaccinated against MMR. So there is a call to action to encourage parents and carers to contact their GPs, make an appointment. If their child has missed their first or second dose, they need to be encouraged hopefully to go and get their, their next one. So there is a need for that as well. So just to give you... So we've lost... Uh... Oh, am I? Am I in? Yeah, you're back. You're back with us again. Oh, I do apologise. Where did I cut out? And um, you can only cut out a little bit. So oh, yeah. I do. Carry do apologise. Just to give you the important data is that the England target for both MMR doses uh, by the age of five years is 95 percent. The latest coverage figure for England is 86.6%. Shropshire are exceeding this target with uh, reporting 91.2%. Uh, however, we do have an MMR elimination action plan in place, which was drafted in 2019 for Shropshire, and some of the targets have been achieved, but there is still some further work to do. So at this stage, uh, attached to the report, you will see the current data for Shropshire, and you will also see the action plan outline and we are reviewing this at present and uh, some areas have been updated on the action plan but it does need review so we are just providing assurance that this is being done at present so the recommendations for this report that we would like to bring to the board today are for the health and wellbeing board to please receive and note the content of the report and support the action plan and work being carried out to improve awareness and members of the board are also pleased asked, asked to act as champions within their services and communities to further raise awareness and encourage immunisation uptake. You can do this by the recent campaign that's been launched by the UK HSA and using their resources and promoting them as wide as possible, please. That's fine. Thank you very much, uh, Steph. Do we have any uh, questions or comments for Steph? Um, yeah, Kirsty. Hi Steph, thank you for a really comprehensive report and all the information in it. I do know though, and wholeheartedly support the recommendation by the way, just a couple of actions maybe for the board to consider. So I'm just going down. If you look at your actions, some of them are as recent as like two or three weeks ago. I wonder if we could bring this back to board too, because a lot of these numbers are only just recently reaction. So it'd be good if we could see how you're progressing, if that's possible Val. Yeah, because yeah. there's so much recent work, which is absolutely fantastic. And just um, just for ease, could you share the link with us for the comms? Is that possible for the campaign so we can share it? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, the, the link, I think, is actually in the paperwork as well, a list of background papers. Um, OK, yeah. Um, sorry, yes, go on. Oh, thank you very much, Steph. Thank you. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate from your comments that the action plan is something that's being refreshed and and worked on at present, which, which, which is which is good. I, just looking at the the numbers uh, for Shropshire, it, if my maths are right, it's it it's roughly about just under nine percent of a co total cohort of eight hundred and five individuals. That have yet to receive a full two dose regime, and and that I think would would add up to roughly about seventy two individuals. And I just wonder, is is there any work building on the uh, um, success and the experience we've had in targeted and individualised approaches that we've taken through the. COVID vaccination program, really looking at the, you know a targeted individualised approach to to to, to increasing the uptake, um, and whether we've got you know learning that we can we can introduce that we've gained over the last year that we can introduce into this program. I mean, I fully support the having an action plan because obviously we need an action plan to maintain high levels, you know, um, o over over the future as well, but whether whether there's a, an, an additional piece of work here that would dovetail with the action plan. I absolutely agree that a targeted approach would be definitely something we could consider and I think as part, as part of our action plan and, and reviewing we need to get professionals around the table and the right people to discuss our next approaches and how we how we move forward with this and I think a targeted approach and there is absolutely going to be some fantastic learning from the pandemic that we can use. So I think as we review our action plan, that is something and I, I'm grateful that you emailed this over in advance as well. And it is definitely something we can consider and as a group take look at how we could possibly take it forward. And I think, you know, when you look, break it down to numbers, it does speak volumes, doesn't it? It really gives you a better picture. So I'm very grateful for you working out the maths as well um, in relation to, to the population. So I think, yes, that is definitely an action to, to note. And as we move forward and review, would be very much considering that and looking with partners as to how we can possibly work towards a targeted approach and use some of that learning. Thank mm. you. Is, is that OK, John? It is. Thanks very much. Steve. Thank you. Uh, Penny. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just to come in on that, um, I think we can. The vaccination program with Bob the bus is still is still ongoing at the moment, and it's working uh, working across our community outreach team, uh, along with the NHS. And the conversations are happening around what we do next and how we continue to work with our communities because it was so successful, exactly as John says, around how we um, take that learning and apply it to other things. So I think Steph, if we get together and connect you with Hannah and um, Saskia who were working on with on Bob. <laughs> Bob and Basil. I think there's a lot more we can do there. Bob, Basil and Betty. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think that yeah, that is that is going to be key, isn't it, as we move forward. So absolutely. Right, well if there's uh, no further questions or comments, um, are we happy to uh, accept the recommendation as printed on the uh, in the that the uh, Health and Wellbeing Board uh, to receive and know the contents of the report support the action plan and the work being carried out to improve awareness. Members of the board are also asked to act as champions within their service and communities to further raise awareness and encourage immunisation uptake. The recent campaign launched by the UKHSA uh, should be supported and uh, content shared by the appropriate professionals to encourage uptake of MMR vaccines in Shropshire. So we're happy to accept that. So that recommendation has uh, been accepted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steph. Um, right, move on to item nine now, which is the COVID verbal update. Thank you very much, Steph. Right. So um, there is a paper that will be sent round after just, and Val's just going to pull up on the screen, which gives the most up to date figures. Um, in terms of where we are. So what I just want to do is give a bit of a current position in terms of the data and then kind of summarise where we are with COVID. 
So um, in terms of overall numbers, we have seen in recent weeks, and you can probably see from the slide that the numbers have started to fall from a peak on the 4th of January, a very high peak on the 4th of January in terms of the number of cases. We still have about 1,000 cases a week. Um, even yesterday, we had over 230 cases that came in. So COVID has not gone away. It's still out there in our communities. And we've got a rate of around 314,000, 100,000 at this moment in time. Um, that, that we do still, as, as Mark said previously, we do still have a high number of COVID cases within our hospitals. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we've got people because the vaccination is doing its job and we are keeping people out of intensive care, but we still do have people in our hospitals. With, and uh, these figures, when they're produced, so we'll be updated figures today. We still have 51 patients in hospital who had COVID. We still have a large number of cases in our care homes as well, in terms of the actual numbers of cases um, and the number of in, 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 in those homes of, and where we're managing outbreaks. Now, again, those are starting to fall and are being managed very, very closely by the teams um, to support care homes. But we are still testing in both care homes, in our hospital settings and, and where we have vulnerable patients. And it's important that we do um, continue to have high infection control measures in those settings. So the fact that we do have COVID still in our communities does impact on our services because we obviously need to ensure um, that we, we, um, we support good infection control, etc. in those settings. So overall, an improving picture, much improved than earlier in the year. We are starting to see a fall. Because the vaccination programme has gone exceedingly well across Shropshire, with over 86% of people having their booster, which is meaning that we are having less severe disease, which is really, really positive in terms of this variant. Um, so we are we will continue to monitor the data, um, but also I have to caveat that with obviously changes to testing programmes that mean that not as many people are testing. Yes, we are in vulnerable settings, so our hospitals, our primary care and our care homes will continue and our social workers will still continue to be required to test because they're working with vulnerable patients. But by and large, those people, those children, our children and young people are not being required to test in the same way. So we will see, we will see a decline. I think so. The overall message is that our numbers are improving. The vaccination, and we're still encouraging everybody to get vaccinated, is holding. But I, I think as we move into this next phase of COVID, um, we will see. And I'm not, it's not when it's it's when we, we it's not if it's when we see future variants. And um, we do expect other variants, and they may not be um, have as mild symptoms as Omicron. So we, as you would expect, we continue to monitor that very closely. So we are moving into a new phase. We are. Um, the government's called living living with COVID. I would call it living safely with COVID. As we move to manage COVID, as we do with other respiratory infections, it's really important that we continue to monitor and that there will be ongoing surveillance so we understand what's happening in our communities, particularly, I come back to vulnerable settings, protecting the most vulnerable within our populations, of which we know we have many in Shropshire, um, and that is for people who have got clinical need, but also some of our target populations where we've seen really high rates and, and impact of COVID in those populations. So we will continue with that. We will, just to assure the board that we do, we will have surge capacity. We need to be ready um, to respond when new variants come. If they are more severe, we need to respond. We will continue to work and protect our high risk settings and work very closely with those. And our focus will become much more on prioritising those who are at risk of serious harm and therefore reducing the burden on our care sector and on our NHS and obviously on individuals um, and focusing on comms and engagement. So we're moving into a new phase of, of the pandemic where whilst the legislation that surrounded the pandemic will be removed, there is still an expectation, there's still guidance and recommendations there that, um, that we recognise that COVID is still out there, that there's still guidance and best practice around um, vaccinations, around wearing masks and enclosed spaces, around testing in the vulnerable settings um, that we would encourage and support people to, to, to adopt. Not just now, but as we've already talked about, particularly as we could move into next winter, these all these, these measures that we've learned through COVID so strongly will help protect us not only from COVID but from flu and all and the other winter illnesses that we know will be coming. Um, so I think I just kind of wanted to finish on that to you know positive news that we are seeing rates falling, but we do still have a high level of COVID out there in our population. So asking um, as the as the move is more that people take responsibility for themselves rather than that we impose legislation, which is is, is a positive move forward, but actually asking people to remember to remember those measures and to use those particularly in those more vulnerable settings. Um, and, I, and I will end with it, just again a, a thanks for everybody and to our public and um, who 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 continue to support us over these few years and have helped protect our most vulnerable um, and obviously the impact that that has. So, but uh, yeah, just I'll pause there for any questions. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel.
Uh, just hope that all the good work that the uh, staff, everybody has uh, done and the public have done doesn't go to waste uh, now that sort of uh, we don't want to take the foot off the, uh, the accelerator. Um, you know, to make sure that we uh, carry on with the uh, safe um, procedures and washing uh, that sort of thing, keeping distance. OK, are there any uh, questions at all for uh, Rachel? No? Right, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, for that update, Rachel. Uh, moving on to my <laughs> chairman's updates. Closure. The updates I've got is notification changes to supplementary opening time hours for Boots, Farms and Shropshire, Telford and Lincoln, uh, the details of which um, have been included with the um, with the agenda and uh, also the uh, correspondence from NHS England Primary Care England uh, received relating to changes of ownership from CG Murray and Sons Limited at uh, Northgate Health Centre, Bridge North, 49 Bullwing Ludlow, the Medical Centre near Lane, Archie Trayton, to the PCT Healthcare Limited. Um, and then also uh, from the 4th of January 22, the pharmacies at Unit 2, Bicton Heath Shopping Centre, of Fangord Road, uh, sorry, Vaughan Road, Clippy Mortimer, Church Street, Bishop's Castle, and adjacent to Rapid Green Surgery. Uh, those um, Pharmacies will now be operated by Avicenna Retail Limited. Um, and so those lists are already included uh, in the agenda. Um, right, uh, so if I can thank all members um, for attending, we'll now move on to uh, our workshop. Oh, sorry, Lynn, I beg your pardon. I just wanted to share if it was possible for me to give a health watch update to the board regarding the work that we've been doing, but also our plans for the future. Yep. That be okay? Certainly, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. So I just wanted to um, let the board know about a few things. So at the moment, we're doing a hot topic on the um, IAP services, the Improving Access to Psychological Therapy Service, as um, part of our priority looking at mental health. Um, across the system. Um, so we'd like support in promoting that, encouraging people to take part in that survey. And that includes people who, who may have not actually been able to access the service as well as those people who've used it. Um, I also wanted to say that we're continuing to be involved in the work of the MSK transformation. And we did um, support the survey that was rolled out and we used it as an opportunity to follow up on a previous piece of work we've done about people's experiences of pain management services. So we'll be reporting on that shortly. Um, we're also hoping to um, bring the Children and Young People's Crisis Mental Health Services report that we've recently published to this board. Um, so if you um, could consider um, whether or not it'd be appropriate for us to bring that report that would be great because really that's part of a much longer program of work that we're hoping to do around children and people's mental health. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was we are in the process of planning for an annual event. We haven't been able to do this for the last two years for obvious reasons because for me um, that event really needs to be a face-to-face -face event and hopefully going forward we'll be able to make it a hybrid event so people can join us online if necessary. And the focus of that annual event we're considering is end of life and that's partly um, as an opportunity to remind people of our previous reports into end of life. Um, care, but also in recognition of the work that's been done as part of the CCG's review of end of life, which we've been part of through um, a group called Growing the Conversation. So hopefully we'll be working with the system to make that event a really informative um, event so people understand um, what they need to consider um, when they or a loved one is coming towards end of life and a real opportunity to talk about what is already happening, but also the improvements that are being made across end of life. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to um, speak to the board really. At the moment, Health Watch Shropshire is planning its priorities for 2022 to 2023. 
Um, and as usual, I, I base our priorities on those at the Health and Wellbeing Board, but also the ICS um, and previously the CCG. So I would welcome any thoughts from stakeholders about what our priorities should be this year. And we certainly have some views from the meetings that I go to, but I just wanted to give people the opportunity to speak to me about what they feel we should be um, focusing on this year. So thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, I don't know, do you want the sort of uh, that feedback now or to give uh, members of the board the chance to uh, digest that and uh, come back to you. With I'm happy either way, Simon. I realise that people might want to have a think about it. Yeah. OK, that's great. Well, look, thank you very much for that. Then. Um, so uh, we now, uh, as I say, that's the end of the, uh, the public uh, meeting. Board members will be reminded for uh, will remain for a workshop. So I'd ask that those present remain and those online rejoin by the link that's been provided by Bantval. OK, thank you to all those who have listened in and participated in the meeting today. And I now declare the public meeting closed. Thank you. Thank you.